My guest today is a dear friend, uh, a mentor, and somebody I've looked up to for a very long time. He's a pioneer uh, in, in the business of kicking. He, in my mind, was the first legitimate soccer-style kicker in the National Football League. And he revolutionized the way we looked at the kicking game, the way we looked at kickers. He bridged the gap from the conventional straight-on style kicker to the modern-day kicker that became such a weapon, not only with accuracy, but with distance, not on field goals, on kickoffs, and also being able to kick in a variety of conditions inside, outside, and most of his career, all of except for the short stint with the Vikings, was spent outdoors in bad weather. And so it's a, it's a real honor and privilege to have on the show today the legendary Jan Stenerud, my Hall of Fame brother. Jan, hello, hello. What are you doing, my friend? Oh, the faint, Martin. I mean, <laughs> how are you doing? I said, just fine, thank you. You know, it's just uh, a remarkable, your life, and I see so many parallels uh, to my own life. Uh, we're both immigrants. You're from Norway. I'm from Denmark. And I find I, when I read your story and, and I talk to you and we talk about it at great length uh, when we get together, we t- I think we talk about our home countries with a sense of longing and a sense of pride, but also a sense of uh, wonder a little bit about how did, you know, I always think, how did a guy from Denmark end up in the Pro Football Hall of Fame? And you have to pinch yourself sometime, Jan, and say, how did this little boy from Norway, from a small town in Norway, end up in Canton, Ohio, to create this tremendous you know, career that you've had. And so I, I would like to start in Norway, if you don't mind, because we have to look at our history and value our history in order to understand where we are today. And I know it's been a few years since you lived there and were a small boy, but can you share some of your first experiences, sports, your way of life, and the pivotal moment when you came to the United States, uh, uh, to Montana State, and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, grew up in Norway, as you said. Born during the war, actually. Born in late 42. Do not remember, of course, anything of the war. I was only two and a half years old, but it ended. But my father and his brothers, the main sport was ski jumping. That was, of course, that was one of the biggest sports in Norway. Has been, you know, since skiing, what ski competition was invented 150 years ago. So as a young kid, my brother and I, we built a little ski jump outside the kitchen window so my dad could turn a light on outside and watch it jump just a few feet. So I think when I was, I was seven years old, I entered my first ski jumping meet, seven and eight year olds. And there were a lot of kids, almost every kid did that. And I finished second. And I remember, still remember the name of the guy that beat me in the first meet. And then I continued doing that for years and years. In the summer, we played soccer. Everybody in the neighborhood, if you had one football or soccer ball and five or six kids, we played in the backyard. We put up goals everywhere. The goals sometimes were just uh, maybe a shoe on each side where the goalposts should have been. And I played soccer and skied all the time growing up, and I remember remember my father, as far as education, he was a carpenter, and he said, the Mm. only advice that he gave me, when he came to education, he says, you and your brother, you got to work, you got to work hard in school, because you got to get an inside job. The winter's the more of a cold. If I I get maybe a teacher, I work at a bank or insurance company or something like that. But anyway, I was a a decent uh, soccer player. Played on the senior team in my hometown when I was a junior, but I was a better ski jumper, and I finished sixth in the junior nationals in ski jumping, and that was the biggest sport in the country in 1962. And out of the blue, I never even thought about my next step. All I was going to probably have tried to go to university it was expensive in those days. Nowadays, universities are free in Denmark as well as Norway, but then it was not. And I get a letter from the ski coach at Montana State. And a Norwegian skier that had been there already, his name was Tor, Tor Fagerost. I remember his name because he won the junior national championship in something called Nordic Combined. 
that is the combination of ski jumping and cross country. And his brother won the junior nationals the next two years. And in 1962, when I actually was asked to be the one of the uh, practice jumpers at Holmenkollen, which is the most famous ski jump in the world, there had 85,000 people there that day, I think. His brother won the Nordic combined again. So I knew the name Tor Fagros, and they offered me a full ride ski scholarship to Montana State. I knew that those things existed. I'd had some friends that had gone to the University of Denver, Colorado, Utah, and some of the schools. So big meeting with my parents. My mother wasn't too crazy about it, but my father says, you got to take, you got to do that. And I always read about America. I had a uh, uncle and aunt that immigrated to Buffalo in the 1920s. And they always came back and they talked about America in, in their terms and talked about the skyscrapers in New York, the big cars. Everything was big and, and, and bold and rich, it looked like to me. And so I accepted the scholarship and really enjoyed my time at Montana State a lot. Met, there were two other guys from the Norwegian, uh, Norwegians on the ski team. All of a sudden, you're, in, you're on the team already with skiers. So you get, you, you get about a dozen friends right away. So I enjoyed the experience. I have to say this more than you understand it too. The university life or experience in the United States is unique because in, in Europe, or most of Europe, the, the, the sports are club sports and the universities and schooling is completely separate. But here you go to a university, the campus they call it, and you have football football team, you have basketball team, you have ski teams, track and field teams. So it was a great, great experience. I enjoyed it very much. So with the background of ski jumping, started in the backyard at your house. Did your father build that little ski jump? He was a carpenter? <laughs> or did you just put some snow together? Just a pile of snow. Yeah. It wasn't big enough. We just got airborne a few feet. But then, as we got to be about 10 years old, we had, we had 28 ski jumps, believe it or not, in a town of 2,000 people. Wow. And three or four of them were lit. At night, so you got to switch to just they had them all the you know poles around the ski jump. So when I started jumping about when I was 11, 12, we jumped almost every night in that, and and we had ski meets almost every weekend. And then as you get older, you know a lot of the people kind of fall out. The better ones kind of go on to the next step and the next step. So by the time I became a junior, I think I was the only one in my hometown that you know went to start competing with people from other parts of the country. And you mentioned Holmenkollen, which is a, for, for our listeners who, who are not familiar with ski jumping, Holmenkollen is uh, in the Oslo area, and it is a very famous ski jumping hill. I mean, it's it's big boy stuff. It's not just your little, uh, you put a little snow together. This thing was Olympic caliber. So you went off the big one? Yeah, I did the biggest hill in Norway, and I was at home was a hill called Vikersund. <laughs> it was bigger than Holman Kong. Mm. But I jumped 118 meters in 1962. That's about... Uh, we have to oh, divide yeah, by 3.3, right? So, I mean, multiply. multiply. Oh. Yeah. Now, now, Morton, on the same speed, the ski jumping has changed so much. It's almost like aerodynamics or airplanes have changed in 50, 60 years mm. from, the, from the propeller planes to the... But anyway, the... Uh, they about the same speed on the takeoff. When you throw yourself into the air, the, the, the guys are really small. I weigh 185 pounds. I was a big ski jumper. Now they weigh maybe 130, 40, 50 pounds. The skis are wider. The skis are wide V style. So the body's in between. So you use your body as a sail almost. And they, they go almost twice as far on the same speed. And they go not nearly as high. The ski jumping was a thrilling sport. I just absolutely loved it. And, um, and you took it to Montana State, <clears throat> and coming to America, at least for me, Jan, was, uh, you know, I barely spoke the language. I don't know how much you spoke English, but I barely spoke it. And what were your first, what was your first impression landing? Because I still remember the day I landed in the United States. What was your first, first impression? Well, I landed in, uh, uh, gosh, Idlewild. It's now called Kennedy Airport. Yeah, I had a sister, I had a sister that had worked, uh, uh, had seen my aunt in Buffalo, gone and see her uh, when my uncle died in 1960. So she actually met me in New York, and she later became a guide at the United Nations. My sister was, but so I was right into you know New York, 
And I remember my sister, Matt, Matt took a cab into a building in New York to meet her. And she said, well, how did you get through the customs? And I said, well, I didn't get through the customs. I just picked up my suitcase and the door opened by itself and I walked out and nobody stopped me. So I thought when the door opened automatically, I thought that's a pretty nice welcome to the United States. So <laughs> I got to spend two day, days in New York and we saw a play. So, so I saw New York City. That was my first memory. Mm. Then we flew to Buffalo, New York, spent a couple of days there. They took a train, 2,000 miles, a train all the way from Buffalo to Montana State. And the lady that met me at the train station, she was actually not with the ski team at all. She was a foreign, foreign, foreign exchange student. And she says, are you James Denner? Nobody else around here. Not me. So she took me to the dormitory, etc. Where did you put your skis in the train? My parents, <laughs> you did. My, father, my, my parents sent me the ski equipment a couple of months later. I just Good. had a suitcase. That was... I just had a suitcase. And my soccer teammates had bought me the suitcase. I guess they wanted me to leave, maybe. They bought me the suitcase. So. You ski jump for a couple of years in Montana State. You become a student there. I imagine you were a great student. And then something really uh, pivotal and something defining uh, happens as you, as life takes you from ski jumping to, of all things, American football. Tell the story, please, of which it's a remarkable, remarkable story. I don't think our listeners know. And it's, it's brilliant. And it, it is such an immigrant American story. Uh, and it sets you up really for your future as, as one of the greatest that ever kicked a football. Yeah, there was one one day that changed my life totally. I didn't know what I was going to do. I, my junior year, 1964, I always ran the stadium steps. I've done that in my freshman year. So, but running the stadium steps was one of my part of my workout for getting ready for the ski season because you jumping in cross country and either particularly in cross country, you've got to be in great shape and. But the, the stadium steps is more for ski jumping and strengthening my legs. But one day, the kicker on the team, and he also played halfback, he was down to kicking field goals. And he kicked with a toe like everybody else kicked in 1964. Uh, everybody except for one, I guess. So, so I asked him after a few, few attempts, I kicked with tennis shoes on, and I noticed that I kicked the ball really further than he did, even with my toes. But I said, can you kick with the side of your foot like you take a corner kick in soccer? As I asked the question, I wanted to know if he knew what a corner kick in soccer was. But he did say, yes, you can kick with the side of your foot. It's actually a guy for the Buffalo Bills. His name is Pete Gogolak. He kicks that way. So anyway, I kicked. I started hitting the ball pretty good, I guess. I didn't, and I enjoyed it. I didn't kick the soccer ball. I didn't have a soccer team, anything for years. So I met him several times that fall, probably five, six times. The unbeknownst to me, the basketball coach had watched me from his, his uh, office window also walked across the field a couple of times and visited and took a look. And he decided to get hold of the football coach and say, you know, the uh, football coach, Jim Sweeney, later coach at Fresno State and is a great coach. And he didn't believe the knowledge of a basketball coach, so he didn't pay any attention to it. But before the last home game in 1964, I was running the stadium steps again. Football team was working out in the stadium. I didn't pay any attention to them. But he, Sweeney has seen many. All of a sudden, I hear this booming voice says, Hey, skier, get your butt down here. He may have used another word than butt, but he got me to <laughs> on the field. And, and it was a break in the action. It was a light workout on the Friday. And they had me kick the ball off the tee, which I'd never done before, on the 40-yard line. And, and the wind was probably five, six miles an hour behind me. And I never put the ball in the tee, never take a running start like a kickoff. And, and I ran, after it, ran at it, and I topped it. It went like a squid kick. And the guys were kind of laughing a little bit. And Sweeney said, no, I'll try another one. And Morton, I hit it perfect. And he went through the goalpost, you know, 70 yards away like a <laughs> kick. Good altitude in Bozeman. And also, so it got pretty quiet. And then he said, can you do that again? Yeah, I think so. So I kicked the next two or three into the seats behind the goalpost. And he put his hand around me and he said, young man, he didn't know my name yet. He says, what are you doing tomorrow? I knew what he was talking about. The next game, last game was the next day. And I thought, this is America. And I went quickly through my, right through my brain. I said, this is in my mind. And said, this is the land of opportunity. If the opportunity, now who knows what the heck is going to happen? Well, I wasn't eligible for the right away. So, but he had me suit up to get used to the crowd. which was 8,000 people at Montana State. Not like Michigan State for you, Morton, later. But anyway, not for spring practice. 
made the team. And in the game my, my senior year then, I kicked a 59-yard field goal. It took about a week to find out, but that broke the college record by five yards and the pro record by three yards. And then I get a telegram. Unlike the draft and all that is today, this is 1965. Uh, yeah, I'd be 65 by then. Yeah, you were. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I got a telegram addressed to Jan Stenerud, care of Montana State Athletic Department. Congratulations, you've been drafted in the third round of the AFL redshirt draft. Signed, Jack Stedman, president, Kansas City Chiefs. Took wow. it over to the coach and he tried to explain to me what that meant. We decided that I should maybe go to school one more fall quarter because since I was through with skiing, although I skied, and was on the football team my first year, go to school one more senior year, one quarter with a quarter system. So I went, and his logic was that if I had did a good job, I also could get drafted by the NFL, because if it is the AFL. Plus, I think he wanted to keep me on the team. So I went to school one more year, and I set a record for most points scored by a kicker. It was only 80-some points, I remember. And sure enough, in the 30 of us that have been drafted by the AFL as future, the NFL had a special draft. Atlanta was the first one to pick. And they picked me. So then I had a choice between the AFL and the NFL. And I ended up signing to Kansas City about four weeks before Super Bowl won. But I wasn't actually a rookie until the next year. So I was not in that first game between the Packers and the Chiefs. But you were, were you at the game? No. As a matter of fact, that was one of my bonuses. <laughs> you know, there's a pretty good bonus because I was drafted by both leagues. It was yeah. pretty decent. But also they added the car. And two first-class tickets. I just got, got married. My first two first-class tickets from Bozeman, Montana, to Oslo. Oh. And tried to explain to them what was going on. And they had never heard of any of this stuff. <laughs> I get back to New York on the 16th of January, which was the day after Super Bowl I in 1967. Anxious to see the newspaper because should I have signed with the other league. But I wanted Hank Stram and Lamar Hunt. They impressed me. Bobby Beathard, as you well know, too. So I saw the score in the newspaper. Packers 35, Chiefs 10. And I thought, oh, wow. Hmm. Then I read over 14, 10 at halftime. And, of course, then my Hank and Hank went to Kansas City, talked to both teams, Atlanta and Kansas City. And Hank impressed me, Lamar Hunt, Bobby Beathard, like I mentioned, signed in Kansas City. And the first game that I played, an exhibition game, of course, that year we started to play the NFL teams. So although we didn't have a real merger the two years later or three years later. But the exhibition season, we played six of them. And the first game was against the Chicago Bears. And Hank had us to camp early. And we scored 66 points against the, against the Chicago Bears. Beat them 66 to 20-some. And the stadium, the old stadium, went crazy. And that was my introduction to pro football. It was pretty neat. Jan, I just want to put a bow on Montana State and your ski jumping career because it ended there, I imagine. I don't know if you've ski jumped since. <laughs> I imagine maybe not. I have not. Absolutely not. So how much in your mind now, now, I talk to a lot of athletes and pro athletes mostly, and they say without exception that doing a different sport has helped them in their, in their you know, football career. Did you in any way feel that ski jumping added explosiveness, added leg strength, added power uh, when you started kicking? Do you think that well, had something to do with it? Ski jumping, I was in good shape. And I, but, but one thing about ski jumping that helped when it actually comes to field goal kicking, maybe I'm searching for something, but I think it did immediately. Because when you stand on top of a ski jump, particularly some of the bigger ones, and when the weather is iffy, you better concentrate. You better, because if you hit that takeoff wrong, you may not land on your feet. So, so from that standpoint, you learn to concentrate. And also, when you stand on the field, kicking field goal for a few seconds, you better concentrate. You better be, you know, be able to compete. So from that standpoint, that helped. But also, when I asked my uh, parents or grandparents if they have a kid that wants to do a different, uh, do a certain sport, I always preach to them to participate in several sports because people do not think maybe that kickers are as great athletes as Herschel Walker. They probably are not. But you got to be a pretty good athlete. You got to have balance. You got to have strength. You've got to be willing to compete. You've got to be a com- good competitor. And you will not get coordination and all those uh, uh, abilities that you need if you just start kicking the football when you're six years old. And that's all you do until you're 20 years old. So I think it's important to develop 
as many athletic abilities as you possibly can. And I think there might be one more thing here that, that at least that I noticed has kind of parallels to kicking. If you're standing on top of on top of a ski hill, you're facing fear. You're facing fear of failing. Uh, you call it concentration. That is certainly a skill you would need. But in kicking, we faced on every kick we were in the game. We faced the fear of failing as well. Do you, do, would you draw a parallel between the two there? And maybe that helped you. Well, my main fear was not keeping my job on the team. Because in the early days, nothing was guaranteed. You know, and, and if you did a poor job, if you had two bad games in a row, which I thought for about 19th year, Borton, you maybe felt that way for 25, but I felt if I have two bad games in a row, I'm going to get cut. Because when I started in the league, there were 22 teams. Now it's 32. And although I was all pro and in my early years, quite a few of them, because I, I did have a talent for this. And that was actually before that, at right that time after my rookie year, when I did kick the longest field goals in the AFL and most field goals, the next year when I came to camp, Hank Stram had gone to England and tried out soccer players from all over the world, it seems like, and brought you know, Horst Muleman and Bobby Howfield and the guy that John Haslam, who was 6'10", brought to the training camp. So it was always competition for that. As far as fear, I always would get a little bit nervous before the game, every game, of course, and particularly in the Super Bowl, Super Bowl Four. But as you know, too, once you get on the field, you get kind of you know, tense. You, of course, there was no warm-up nets. You just stood there and stretched the best you knew, and you kicked the, the game ball, which not the, the best one to kick. It was brand new and hard. And, and he lied on, the, lied on the sideline the whole time in cold weather sometimes. But once the coach said, field goal, field goal team, then I don't remember what I thought. I was just so involved in that that I just, uh, I guess I was just concentrating on, you know, rhythm and timing, rhythm and timing. Right. By, that time, by that time, all the nervousness is gone. There's no question that you anticipate this on the sideline. So I want to talk about just, <clears throat> the change in kicking and, and what your take is on it, because you clearly was a guy, like I said in the intro, who changed the way we look at the kicking game now. And, and that speaks for itself, Jan. That's You're in the Hall of Fame. You're the first kicker in the fo fo Pro Football Hall of Fame. And there, and there's a reason why you're the first kicker. So why yeah, yeah. why did you stand out amongst your peers, you think, doing yeah. this career? I, I, had it, I had it early on. My first six, seven, eight years in the league at least. For some reason, I kicked the football further than anybody else. We had the, the old stadium in Kansas City, George Toma was the famous groundskeeper. He still has all the Super Bowls at 95 years old. Mm -hmm. there was, he kicked on the 40 yard line. There were 73 yards to that wall. And he would mark X's on that wall where my kickoffs would hit. Mm -hmm. And I when they played in that stadium. I was the only one that could hit that wall. You know, people from other teams came. So, I had a natural ability to hit the ball hard. But I also kicked differently. From 25 yards, I just kind of guided a little harder from 35. And it wasn't until my 13th, 14th year that I decided, well, kick every ball hard. You don't get penalized for kicking it too far. And But also the, my first steps, the first year in college, Morton, there was no uh, ESPN or NFL network. I didn't see the other soccer style kicker, the two goal galaxies in the premium. I didn't see them live. I didn't see them on television. My first step back in the, my first year in football, the first four or five games, I stood one yard away from the ball. My first step was backwards, like a rocking step backwards and then forward. And then by the time the next, after a few games, I kind of developed a style that I always, uh, always kept. But I didn't see anybody else. I didn't know. And I didn't even take, you didn't either, I don't think. We didn't put the foot where the ball was going to be and then step back. No, back. no. Played it by ear like it took a, uh, you know, a free kick in soccer or whatever, a penalty kick. So there was no really system to it. That middle of my late in my career, that start doing more of that. I thought, well, that is that is wise. And I brought in the kicking net and and also then towards. So I went through about twenty years of evolution. Uh, and I changed some, but also the biggest change is, uh, of course, in the early days, the quarterback always held the ball. Then it was my holder, and most of the time, the center. So on Friday afternoon, they have one practice field after training camp. I said, Lenny, if you haven't kicked, you know, a, a field goal in practice with the center and the holder all week. And he was like, well, EJ, all of tired. You might have taken it in already. <laughs> yeah. 
So we got so so we did the practice was but I talked to George Blinder. He said all he kicked in those early years that I was in the league. He kicked six kicks or five kicks from 37 yards. And if he made all five, he took it in. So now we started hiring special team coaches in the late 70s. And then we started to break the punters in as holders. And that was important because at least we could have time for them and have underhand the ball to them so they could practice catching the ball and turning the strings a little bit. So when I was still in the league, we didn't have a snapper yet full time. But we start getting more reps. So in Green Bay, for example, I kicked over 90% one year. Oh, yeah. And and while I was there, but the main reason was because the conditions were hard, but we started to get reps, and they made a heck of a difference. So I went through this evolution, and now, Morton, as you know, when we kicked 50-yard field goals early in their career, 50-plus, almost 60, that was a big deal. And now if you miss from 50, is a big deal. But you do have a football that's very well suited for kicking. You have good fields. You kick from eight yards instead of seven, like I did early on. I got a lot of them blocked in seven and a half. But still, they are, I admire them. They are getting really, really good. But it's getting to be more pre- precision. I watched a kid in, in Baltimore, for example, Justin Tucker, and, and we got Butker too, Harrison in Kansas oh, City. Yeah. He struggled with extra point, but I, I still think he's one of the top two, three kickers in the league. The bait is strongest right now. Uh, but they, they, they do it so precisely, almost like a golfer when you dress a golf ball or whatever. So all this thing has gotten better and better, and they are – really 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 good and it's not quite as easy as it looks and i think <clears throat> I'm, I'm i'm completely with you and you're kind of answering the next question i have or had so we're, we're partly there already how has the kicking game changed over the years and you've kind of gone through in your experience how how it was for you which man i i you know i didn't realize that you did not have any pre-game kicks that would have bothered me not to be able to kick right before a game. No, no, no. I was talking about during the week. Oh, but even right then, then, I mean, even then. You could overtake, we go out. No, very few kicks during the week during practice. In training camp, because you brought in five, six kickers in those days, you competed for your job. Yeah. But then training camp was done. Gerald Wilson had a great punter. After warm-ups, I would put the ball in the grass. The grass was long on the practice field. Kick over the goalpost, you know, in the end zone. The cross of the punter. He would punt it back. We did that, and then they went over and held the bag and tried to run down the field if they needed. We only had 40 players on the team a few years before that, Morton. They had 33 and then 38. So when I started in, the, in 67, that was a year or two after I went to 40. So they started to use people like me that couldn't do anything else but kick. You didn't have to play another position. So the timing from that standpoint right, was right. But in pregame, we would go on uh, snappers and uh, kickers, go out five minutes early. So we kicked a few kicks in each direction. We did do that. But there was no kicks then during the game, of course, because the Lenny was yeah. Lenny in, in the Super Bowl year. I think Lenny got hurt. They brought in Jackie Lee. He got hurt right away. Tom Flores came in and helped for me, actually. was with us in Super Bowl four as a backup quarterback. And he won six games with Mike Livingston. We had a great defense, and he kicked a lot of field goals that year during the season, I remember. But at that season, I think I had four holders and three different snappers. And I would, not a tremendous amount of practice. But I think my phone is ringing somewhere. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Hey, yeah. that's that's a so that's team. I think that might be I might be the Kansas City Chiefs. I, I heard <laughs> that Buckner just pulled a hamstring, and yeah. you had, no, I wouldn't I wouldn't jinx him like that. But they're ready to sign you, Jan. Somebody asked me the other day, "Are you available?" I says, "Yeah, I'm available, but I'm not, I'm not ready at all." <laughs> hey, well, this Harrison is a wonderful man. He, you've met him, I know, because they're from your area. And he talks about you, but I talk to him occasionally, not during the season so much, but he is just a fabulous young man. And he's taken, hey, what he's doing? He is, has people workouts and he has personal trainers, I believe, in addition to what they do at the stadium every day. Yeah. He's approaching kicking like this Bryson de Chambeau is doing with golf. Yeah. He's trying to find certain exercises, yeah. and certain even diets and practice to, you know, to kick the ball further and further and further. Yeah. So he's he, taking it to the next level all the time. So it had to be surreal for you a little bit. You you have you were in four Pro Bowls. You were in the Pro Bowl in 1970, 71, 75. And then there's a period of almost 10 years. And then after your great season, uh, I believe it was with the uh, Minnesota Vikings, you go back no. to the Pro Bowl. Or was it Green Bay Packers? Yeah. Oh, Green Bay Packers. 
Oh, my best year I ever had. I didn't make the Pro Bowl in the voting sometime. There's a, I know, but I'm saying that almost a 10. Yeah, last Pro Bowl was in uh, 84, but I also had a couple of AFL All Star games before yeah. the first Pro Bowl. So that's one unfair thing about some of the AFL All Stars. Sometimes they don't get credit for the AFL All Star team. So the, 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 uh, my first AFL All Star game was in 68. Yeah. And then the last Pro Bowl was in 84. So I think that's what you're alluding to. I'm alluding, was, I'm alluding uh, to the fact that there was a long period of time between, you know, 68 and 84. I mean, 68. that's an incredible amount of body of work that you played at a very high level. And I just want to let the listeners know right now, Jan, and I don't want to embarrass you in any way, but the NFL 75th anniversary all-time team the NFL 100th anniversary all-time team, the Kansas City Chiefs Hall of Fame, the Green Bay Packers Hall of Fame, your number three retired by the Kansas City Chiefs, nine All-Pros, six times in the NFL, three in the AFL, as I just mentioned, four Pro Bowls, Super Bowl champion, and member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame class of 1991. How does that sound to you, Jan? How does that make you feel when I go through all of that? And I haven't even talked about All-American by the Sporting News in 66, okay? Three times Big Sky champion in ski jumping, All-American ski jumper. I can well, go on and on here. So well, you and, dug pretty deep. And one thing, I'm glad I kicked that early because if you had been in camp against me in the early 80s, I'm you may have shortened my career by a few years. So. We would have had a yeah. good little run. Yeah. When you read your stats, mine are pretty good. But uh, if you read all your stats, more than it would take a long time. It's a different a time. I so anyway, to... when I hear that thing, it is. It's no question. We talked about it, you know, a few minutes ago or several minutes ago. My life changed. You never know, you know, in life. There are a lot of certain moments that you just never know. And even after 13 years pro football, the Chiefs thought I was too old. And I, my career was just about over. And then Bart Starr was the head coach for the Packers. And he needs help. And basically calls and asks me, can you still kick? And I said, yes, I can. And that paved the way for six more years. And if it had been for him or that opportunity when I, when I was able to still perform at the high level, none of this thing would have really happened. So there are a lot of twists and turns along the, along the journey, as you well know. And all of us in life have. Yeah. So I want to talk to you about Kansas City. And I, by my count, Jan, you played with seven Hall of Famers. You played with two Hall of Fame head coaches and a Hall of Fame owner. That's 10 Hall of Famers in 13 seasons in Kansas City. So the greatness in that locker room had to be contagious. Let me start by asking you, how was Hank Stram and Lamar Hunt able to get so much talent in the building at the same time? Oh boy, I don't know all the answers there, of course, but in your, Hank, just in your Hank, my early years, though, when the AFL NFL started, uh, the AFL was a disadvantage, but also Lamar had money too. So people like Buck Buchanan, for example, and EJ Hollow, by the e, EJ Hollow may not be familiar to you. EJ Hollow was drafted by. Uh, the, uh, the great defensive uh, and Bob Lilly told me one year that E.J. Holub was the greatest college football player I'd ever seen. E.J. Holub, he had a choice to go to any league he wanted to. He signed with the Chiefs because of Hank Stram and Lamar Hunt. E.J. was our starting outside linebacker in Super Bowl One. He got hurt, played, and he was our starting Super Bowl center in, center in Super Bowl Four. Also, they hired a guy called Warren Wells. And I think he was one of the first coaches that went to all the black, black schools, like Grambling, like Morgan State. Grambling had Buck Buchanan, for example. Yep. Willie Brown from Oakley, a lot of great players from Grambling. Morgan State, Willa Lanier. So they also, Emma Thomas played the Bishop School down in, down in the Dallas area. So that was a big, they, they paid attention to, to all those schools. And Hank was a salesman. He was a heck of a, he was a tremendous coach. And he was a good salesman. Lamar was totally opposite. Low-key, wonderful, wonderful man. So they did a great job. You know, and, and of course, the NFL, they started the Dallas Cowboys. They started as the Dallas Texans. They were there for three years. It's 1963, they moved to Kansas City. In 1961, and people probably don't know this, the younger people, 
Dallas didn't become a team of the, the, the Cowboys until 1961. Texans started in 1960 with the AFL. But the, so the NFL that they put Dallas in there, Dallas Cowboys, to basically force Texans out of town because they couldn't compete with the, the NFL. So that's why they moved to Kansas City. They were talking about going to New Orleans, but ended up in Kansas City. But we had we had we had a lot of talent. But I think Hank and the, and the, the scouting system too. Bobby Bethard, for example, who later became a GM at both in the Redskins and San Diego, he was a great talent scout. We had a Tommy O'Boyle, who was my was a talent. We didn't call him general manager. He was a head talent scout. So they did a good job of that. But people like Buck, Bobby Bell, Will Lanier, Curly Culp, who we traded for from from uh, Denver. I mean, they were great, great players. Aaron Brown. We had, uh, you know, Johnny Robinson, uh, who was from LSU, and Jim Kearney and Emma Thomas and Jimmy Marsalis. I don't think I left anybody else out. These were great, great players. Yeah. We didn't know at the time. We didn't talk about the Hall of Fame. The first one to be in the Hall of Fame was Bobby Bell in 1983. You know, that wasn't really something we even thought about. Nobody thought about that then. So are there any of, of your Hall of Fame teammates in Kansas City who stood out to you more than others, by either by his personality or the way he played, the way he affected the game? Was it Willie Lanier? Was it Bobby Bell? Was, there, was it Hank Stram? Well, I never forget Hank Stram. When I came to my first, before my rookie year, Hank Stram came out to the practice field two or three weeks before training camp started, and he held, for, held the ball for me three or four times at least. Three or four evenings. He wanted to chart me from the right. Of course, the hash marks were out wide in those days. So he wanted to chart me in the right hash mark. You get some idea if I get in trouble, what he could help me with. But the people that you, you come back to Bobby Bell, he has a real character. Hasn't changed. Same way today. Bobby could keep up the defensive back in the 40 yard dash. He played defensive end his first year, actually. He had gone to Minnesota as a quarterback. He came from Shelby, North Carolina, but they wouldn't let him play quarterback. So the offense and defensive lineman, he could throw the, throw the football the length of the field. He definitely stood up. But also Willie, when we stood on the sideline and see a running back from the other team running into the line, line and if they got, went backwards, we knew there was Willie that made the tackle or made the first hit. But also Willie had head injury because he learned to tackle with a, you know, the helmet, the head first between the numbers. He actually got seriously injured the first year. And that's why you saw him second. The next rest of his career had this big helmet in the middle. He changed the tackling, used the shoulders instead of the head first. But he stood out. Buck stood out. I mean, but as far as the personality, Willie and I are really good friends. We talk about all sorts of things quite often. Buck was a really gentleman. What I have to say for this guy is Fred Arbanis. Uh, here I am as a kicker. Never even tried to play football all the way in the pregame. They always ran down with the wide receivers to catch the ball, even in pregame warm-up, because I could do that. And that's Hank didn't know what to do with me. So I'd participate in some of those uh, drills, kind of. But they welcomed me instead of saying, well, he's just a, you know, God, the darn kicker. I thought that was one word for a while. <laughs> <laughs> thought that was your first name? <laughs> that was, a, that was, a one, it was It was one word. <laughs> A something kicker. Yes, I, I got you. But anyway, the uh, they welcomed me. They knew I would. I could probably help the team some, and they 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 did not. They welcomed me with open arms, and that made me feel very comfortable. Our band is and David Hill, EJ Hollow, and those guys. Otis Taylor. They made me feel comfortable. Ed Buddy. Ed Buddy, a great player. Well, it also helped when you put the ball through the uprights. You you tend to have more friends. Yeah, and there are times you don't have friends too, but you don't do so well. But it happened a couple of times, as you well know. Yeah, yeah, and you had such a long career. Um, and I want to throw a few names at you. And I, whatever comes to mind when I say these names that you have played with, that have coached with you and for you, please, please, uh, any anything goes here. You you pretty much talked about Hank Stram. Are, are there a couple of words you can use to describe Hank Stram besides hands on? Because it it seems like he was hands on, holding the ball for you to see how he could help you in the game. I mean, that's pretty, uh, wow, that's detail-oriented. But if I am if I say Hank Stram to you, you, you say what? He gave me a lot of confidence. Bill, they bragged of everybody, told me how good you were, and he was very innovative. Tried everything. And it worked for him. Yes, it did. Lamar Hunt. 
nice, quiet, wonderful man, always had a blue blazer and gray slacks. You had no idea. You thought maybe it was a school teacher instead of being one of the richest and nicest men in the world. Len Dawson. Lenny the Cool. He was, he didn't look, you know, he was built kind of like I was. Maybe he didn't look like a, you know, a pro football player with the, the body, but he was very competitive and very good and, and, and so cool under pressure and very competitive and uh, very, I mean, strong-minded. Just a tough, tough-minded guy. Didn't look like it, but he was. Tom Flores. Nice man. He actually, when I think of Tom, he came back because we had two quarterbacks hurt, hurt. So he held for me. And, of course, he played quarterback at Buffalo and a great coach. But the one I remember about him, so quiet and nice. But he, he sent Hank sent us in for a fake field goal. And I was supposed to block the guy rushing from the outside. And I missed him. Of course, I tried to. But the guy ran around me. And Tom completed the pass, hit Robert Holmes in the hands, went for a touchdown. But uh, the, the outside rusher knocked the helmet off of Tom Flores. He hadn't even buttoned the chin strap. So <laughs> I don't have a really good memory, but he forgave me for that. Marv Levy. Well, interestingly enough, now they're really good friends uh, because he cut me. So that stung me for a while there. They turn out. He ended up in the Hall of Fame. He got cut from Kansas City. Great job in Buffalo. Years later, we're both in the Hall of Fame. We're great friends. He, uh, Nick Lowry took over after me. Nick was a terrific kicker. He was also 15 years younger. And so I could see how Marty made that, made that uh, change. They're good friends now. Great coach. You get to the Super Bowl. I know they haven't won one yet. But you go and get the other team back up after they lose the Super Bowl and get him back to the Super Bowl after a loss four years in a row. You got to call him a great, great coach. You know what you just said about Marv Levy resonates with me because I had a, I had the same feeling with Jim Mora, who who cut me uh, when I was with the Saints, and we're great friends now too. So I know when when I decided I'm not going to be carrying around with this negative baggage anymore. Was there a time with you and Marv Levy that you reached out to him, or he reached out to you, or was it just a natural progression of you know that, let's water under the bridge, be be done with that? It happened, Martin. I worked for a firm after football, HNTB Corporation. We designed stadiums, all of professional college stadiums around the country. So I would go to the NFL meetings where the owners met for years and years. So I'd be at those meetings, and that's when I ran into Marv Levy all the time. So that's that was before, I think before I got into the, no, I met, I got into the Hall of Fame. Well, before Marv was, I saw him in those meetings. And one day at breakfast, he was sitting there with his wife, and I was walking by. And I said, Marv, I stuck out my hand and said, Listen, so nice to see you and great job. And I know I heard from friends that he was relieved after that, and he, he felt good that that happened. So uh, I mean, it wasn't, it was, it's automatic for a competitor. You get a little upset. A lot of people in pro football, Martin, hardly anybody go out on their, on their own terms. Also, a lot of the biggest names in football, they get traded maybe the last year or that something happens and, and you carry some of that with you for a little while. Yes, and it do. happens 90, 95% or maybe more in the league. But that's the way it is. I feel so fortunate that I got the years in that I had. And I have, uh, to my knowledge, I don't have any, I don't think anybody, have any, I don't have any hard feelings against anybody. I haven't had that for a long, long, long time. I feel very lucky, but I'm glad I got to, Make up with more because there's no question. Did that a long time ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. But but that was just kind of silliness in some way. So time would have taken care of it too. But we did it the right way. And we every time we see each other, we we really get along just great. I can relate so much to this, Jan. Personal pride is a really strong, powerful um, you know, entity inside of you when you're a competitive human being. And I know you're competitive, and I so am I. So uh, the, the, the sting and the bitterness is there for a while because you feel it's unjust. And when you are removed from the situation, maybe the big picture becomes a little clearer. And so I'm so glad you guys had a chance to do that. And at the end of the, your career, you go to, you know, you go to, to Green Bay and Minnesota and you really have tremendous years there. I remember going to Green Bay and watching a game, a playoff game. You were playing the St. Louis Cardinals. Your opponent was Ray Stakowicz. And you had a great game, that playoff game. And kicking outside in Green Bay in January, that is no easy feat, my friends. 
they weren't hard. The field wasn't very good in those days, and maybe still used the, the regular balls that we used in the games. But Ray Stackowitz, by the way, he held for me. That was the first punter I had to hold for me. And that year, I only missed two kicks the whole season, kicked over 90%. And Ray was not afraid of the pressure. I mean, he stepped right in and did a heck of a job. I just thought about him the other day. He was a neat guy, and he was a teammate of yours. Yes. And that's why you came to the game, I believe, in 1981. I to, well, I came to see Ray, and it was the first time I had ever met you. And you had been, as I said in my intro, a mentor and somebody I looked up to and said, wow, if, if I can. And I was about to leave to you know college and get drafted, hopefully, and all those things. And you, you made such a strong impression on me, your professionalism and the way you conducted yourself. You're such a gentleman, the way you carry yourself. And, and I will never forget that day at Lambeau Field, the old Lambeau Field, and meeting you after the game and shaking your hand and being quite nervous. But you had a fantastic game. And there's a couple of people that also spent some time in Green Bay. I'd like to get your opinion on Bart Starr. Yeah, I talk about nice people. Uh, I think some of old teammates like Jerry Kramer and all these guys that tried to find faults with him, they couldn't find any. He is just a marvelous man. And he talked about as good a people as he ever going to meet. But also, I think he was one of those really strong-minded quarterbacks like Glenn Dawson, really great competitor and. And I don't think he had maybe the talent like some other people like that could throw the ball the length of the field, but what a tremendous team leader and a and a quarterback. He was there at the right time with Vince Lombardi. And well, I, I guess it has been duplicated some by what the Patriots have done, but the run they had in Green Bay was phenomenal. Bar star, I just love the man. I cannot think of one thing about him that uh, is not great. He was uh, just a fabulous man. James Lofton. James Lofton. We still, when we laugh a little bit, when I see him, because he was drafted number one a few years before I got there, a couple of years. So I was interviewed by a uh, uh, some TV station at, at second or third year in Green Bay. And I said, what do you think about James Lofton? And I said, boy, he is great. I mean, he is fluid. He's a great athlete. You know, the only one that I think it can match him uh, is Otis Taylor in Kansas City. He was a and so I can't remember exactly the words I used, but the next day James says, hey, you think Otis is better than I am, huh? You know, he gave me a hard time that I had maybe said that Otis was every bit as good as James Lofton. But James was a great player. Just a tremendous athlete. I think he played wide receiver for 16 years. And, of course, a Hall of Famer and, and should be. Very intelligent, smart guy. Went to Stanford. Good friend. And then I have three guys I want to end with on the name game here that you that were associated with Minnesota Vikings, which I was alluding to a picture between you and I. I was with uh, the Saints, and you were with the Vikings. And pregame, we took a picture or postgame. I don't remember exactly when. And I still have the picture. I think I sent it to you. You're in the Vikings uniform. I'm in the Saints uniform. So uh, what a great – that was just another surreal moment for me personally, Jan, to actually be in a game – playing against you and uh, i think we we had pretty good games both of us so i was happy about that i can't remember who won the game i don't remember if i do remember more than we see brag on, on each other but the first time i saw you kick off for the new orleans saints and they were how hard you hit the ball i also knew the balls we were kicking in those days i thought huh he might be stronger than i was when i was 24 five years old so it didn't take me long it didn't take you long to uh, to realize what talent you were. And and when you do that for 25 years, like I remember Jim Sweeney, my old coach, says, didn't you, weren't you in the league for 19 years? I said, yeah, why do you ask? He said, well, you got to be a pretty good competitor. And that was from the coach. And and uh, that was a compliment. And I appreciate him saying that. And uh, somebody mentioned something about Buffett the other day. It's a good competitor. Yeah. You're not right. He has to be. You have to be. You have to be. And another way, and I'll get back, it reminds me of another story that I heard in Green Bay, and it's almost folklore about you. Before, in training camp, you had to do a conditioning test. Now, you're competitive, and you were in great shape. And in Green Bay, you had to finish in a certain time. I don't know if it was a mile and a half or an obstacle course, but the rumor is that you beat everybody pretty much. This was in Minnesota. Okay. Rod Grant, over the years, he didn't expect 
the veterans to be, because they played a lot of exhibition games there. They, he, they probably did less in the offseason maybe than some of the other teams. It meant they started using run the 440, then you waited 90 seconds, ran 440 again. So, so I had done that for years. So before Green Bay, Les Steckel had become the coach. They fired Bud and brought Bud back another year. So they have what they call the Ironman contest. And they have about six, seven events. Uh, you had to run the cones, you had a 40 yard dash, you run the gassers, you had to do your body weight. How many times you could lift your body weight bench press? There were sit ups in two minutes. But one of the, one of the exercises you took twice your body weight and put it on hip slant. You would lie underneath the hip. And so I went 190, so I had 380 pounds that I had to lift. And I did 66 reps in two minutes. But that was the second best on the team. A guy called Steve Jordan. Yes. And his son I was playing defense event for the Saints, isn't it? Mm-hmm. He had more. He was the only one on the team that had more than I did. But I, 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 no, I kept myself in pretty good shape. I would, say, I would Hey, just the skier, that's what we did, Mark. Yes. <laughs> Skiing and drinking schnapps. <laughs> you were mentioning, you mentioned uh, Bud Grant. What was your relationship with him and what's your feelings about Bud Grant? Yeah. You know, Bud Grant was the coach. Uh, when they played us for the Minnesota Vikings in Super Bowl four, And the Minnesota Vikings was favored by 13, 14 points, and we upset and we beat them 23 to 7. And I remember I got traded up from Green Bay, actually, to, to Minnesota in 84. The headline, or well, not the headline, but fairly good on the sports page, at least, in, uh, in Minnesota was that Vikings get old nemesis was the... I was a nemesis to the Vikings you know, many, many years before. So, but during the uh, training camp, he he didn't really, he was an absolute the born leader. I mean, he spoke, everybody was dead quiet. He didn't say much to the team. He didn't believe in this big speeches before the game. I said, what's the use? If I give it this big speech, you read to run through the wall, somebody fumbles on the opening kickoff, that speech is gone. It's a preparation <laughs> during the week, you know. But a lot of times he would stand up next to me because those days the practices got so long. In the early years, he practiced an hour and 15 minutes. Now they were over two hours. So a lot of times he would end up standing right next to me. And we just didn't have much to talk about. But then we still became friends. And he was so he was so nice to me towards the end. And also he is in the Hall of Fame. And I was up at the famous Bud Grant garage sale that he has every year. I was up in Minnesota a couple of years ago and I saw the news that he's going to have the I hadn't seen him in years. And I drive up to his house. He looks at me and he says, no Norwegians allowed in here. You know, <laughs> so, you know, nice visit. He was, of course, he played pro, pro basketball, too. Really? And he, he was a fine, just such a, so much uh, uh, common sense Hall of Fame. I mean, common sense coaching. Mm-hmm. You just kind of expected what's going to I bet you a lot of, he didn't, could, he hated turnovers. And offside, he, he cut a defensive end, I think, was, was, was drafted in the second round in 85, and he was offside a couple of times in the preseason game. He gets rid of him. He says, you can't win that way. So there's no, there's no uh, uh, surprise that he, that he achieved so much. Yeah. He was a great coach. Great coach and, and so respected. I mean, they, but, but whatever he said, when he walked in the room, it got quiet. He was the leader. And our late great friend, Hall of Fame brother, Chris Dolman, who also was with the Vikings. Yeah, we were teammates. His rookie year was my last year. Uh, great player. God darn it. Miss him. And he became, by the way, as you went, he took up golf. And I played golf with him uh, oh, three or four years ago. And he, uh, we had, had a good visit. I was impressed by his golf game, and but he became a tremendous linebacker. There was no first-round draft choice. That was that's what he should have been, and he had that kind of a career. I think he. Yeah, I think it was defensive, was, eh? defensive line. Yeah, yeah. But I, think I started as a pass rusher. Yeah, pass rusher. Yeah, that's right. So yeah. those are interchangeable a lot of times. Only fifty-eight years old or so when they died. It was, it was tragic. Yeah. Really like, really like. And then a guy I started out with in 1982 with the Saints. He was traded to Houston, and then he went to Minnesota, Archie Manning. <laughs> Archie and I were roommates in 1985. And Tommy Kramer was a backup quarterback. No, but he's a starting quarterback. But he had to play the Bears. And Tommy got hurt. 
and Archie had to go in and play it against the Bears quarterback, the defense that they had, and this was in Soldier Field, and Archie got beat up. I mean, that was a that was a heck of a defense he had to go up against. But Archie was great, and of course, I think Eli was born about that time, and Cooper, the oldest son, and Peyton were running around on the practice field on Saturday morning. And also, Don Hasselback was on the team that one year, the tight end for New England, and his two sons were running around on the practice field on Saturday morning. So there you had four NFL quarterbacks running around on the field as, as seven, eight, nine-year-olds. Pretty special time. Jan, I want to end with a couple of current events, if you don't mind. A couple of uh, just a, your opinions on the on your on your current teams that you've played for, and um, maybe just some evergreen. Doesn't have to be specific because this will air a little bit later after the Super Bowl, so we don't really want to talk specific games. But just in general, your thoughts. Uh, you live in Kansas City. It's got to be pretty cool for you now to have the Chiefs at such a dominant team again. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of years since they uh, when I came to Kansas City, the team was the town was on fire also because I've been to Super Bowl one and then we had a lot of success the next few years. I came there's a wonderful time. And now it might be better than ever. Of course they have so much media these days too, but this Patrick Mahomes, I don't I've been watching this for fifty five years plus, maybe more. I mean he's tremendous. He is maybe the most exciting but, of course, you've got so many great quarterbacks. It's hard to spit, but he is as good as anybody I've ever seen. Because he can do so many phenomenal things uh, that are almost uh, backyard football in so many ways. He is great. And Travis Kelsey is phenomenal. Tyreek Hill, he has a lot of weapons. Tyreek Hill is sensational. They, no, they, this town is so much fun right now. The Chiefs, and also with the pandemic and all the stuff going on, the Chiefs are a very important part of this community. And the Chiefs have given us a lot of pleasure. They are. And Andy Reid, Andy Reid, he will be automatically in the Hall of Fame as one of the greatest coaches ever. So the Chiefs, uh, so proud of being the Chief right now. And I always have been. But right now, it's really fun to be recognized as a former Kansas City Chief even because I'm so proud of the organization and the players. What, what do you think it would take for Andy Reid to be considered or to surpass Hank Stram as the greatest coach in Chiefs history? Or is that possible? Well, I don't want to get into that. Hank was my coach and always will be. <laughs> exactly. I was hoping. I knew you would say that. Coaches to the three AFL championships in 10 years and a lot of innovations or whatever. But Andy Reid in lifetime in lifetime victories and uh, and wins. No, he is he is uh, he is near the top of any coach ever. No, no question about that. When we look at the Packers, Jan. Uh, where would you rank Rodgers among the Packers, three Hall of Fame quarterbacks, Star, Favre, and then Rodgers, who obviously, when he finishes, will be in the Hall of Fame? Yeah. Yeah. Where do well, you... You, you play in different eras. eras. You know, uh, I, I play with Lynn Dickey a lot. He, Lynn Dickey and I play golf a lot. And he was a great quarterback with us. And he's my good friend. And He also says that, that Aaron Rodgers, he, I don't think he's seen anybody better than he is. He is phenomenal. Far was phenomenal. Far didn't throw the ball like that, but as a team leader and a captain and calling all the plays and and being the you know being the, the leader of the team, I don't think anybody ever will surpass the absolute legend of Bart Starr in Green Bay. Now, I know it changes because a lot of people are gone from that that area. They, people aren't around anymore. They're a long time ago. Uh, so as far as a name and a legend, Bart Starr, I don't think ever will be surpassed. Uh, but the god darn uh, Aaron Rodgers is it's hard to say that there's anybody better than he is although I if I had to pick between him and Mahomes it wouldn't be an easy pick would it no well Mahomes is is already being consider, considered one of the greatest chiefs of all time do you agree with that oh, he should be Yeah. what he has done is just uh, it is so fun to watch and the thing about him is he said he, he's handled himself like he's like like he loves Kansas City and, and we love him and the way he has handled himself as a young man and keep working so hard and saying and doing the right things all the time. It is a remarkable young man to go through all the stuff that he has been. We talk, talk about being under micro, uh, microscope and also have to be criticized if you take one step wrong or whatever. He's just a fantastic young man 
And I can't see how anybody could have done it as well as he has done to this point. And I'm sure he will continue to. So you're on the all-century team. Adam Vinatieri is on the all-century team. Who's the greatest kicker of all time? You get all my balls, Morton. No. <laughs> yeah. That's not yeah. fair. And it's, a, it's not a fair question. I know. But, you know, I guess you have to go to eras, I suppose. I feel comfortable in my era. You should feel very comfortable being the best for a long, long time. Adam, he's had all the records in the world, including Super Bowl, uh, you know, big, big games and the biggest games. Uh, and now I see uh, uh, Justin Tucker, the way he handled himself, and maybe even taken even the next step. Yeah. So if it, if it pure numbers, the younger guys are going to be better numbers. But in eras, I, I don't know, Martin. But they what? For right now, uh, three names that comes to mind. And right now, before people, Justin, Bucker, and Butker, these guys, their whole history hasn't been written yet. I think the most expert mention it, uh, Adam Terry and Morton Anderson, it, it, it's always mentioned in the same breath, but I'm a little bit older, so that's why I get in there as well. Well, there's room for all three of us. Let's go with that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and then if we have to add a couple more, which we gladly will do, the more the, I say, the more the merrier, as long as they've earned the right to be there. Absolutely. And nobody sneaks in there, Morton. There's no, a lot of people that you think should be in and aren't. It's, a, it's pretty difficult. Yeah, there's not an unlocked back door to this one, man. It, it, uh, as you know, and, and, and I want to say this to you personally, as I was a candidate for the Hall of Fame for several years, thank you so much. And I mentioned it in my Hall of Fame speech, you were such an advocate for me. You were such a... Uh, proponent of, of getting me into the hall. Maybe you were bored. You were getting tired of being the only guy there, but you no, were just it, tremendous. And I want to thank you personally, really. Thank you, Sal. I didn't have anything to do with it. They said people ask me, who's going to be the next kicker? Morton Anderson. That's a, that's a no-brainer. Morton Anderson. Oh, that was a little bit surprised. It took two or three or four years. It should five, have been a, five years. Th yeah, that was a surprise. That was the only surprise. Yeah. Jan, it's been a pleasure, man. I kept you way too long. We said 30 minutes. It's been over an hour. But, you know, when good friends talk, time flies. Yeah. Well, you can cut some of the things out that yeah, yeah. didn't make No. Yeah, we'll. No, oh, listen, uh, I'm going to see you soon. I hope but I've, I've missed you now for more than a year. Well, we'll come and see you in Kansas City. I don't know if there's spectators. That wouldn't be bad. Are you going to the game? No, I'm not. No. I, I am not. I had, this is the first year I've ever gone to a game. But I tell you what, uh, I watch it like most people on TV. And I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, but I'm not. I'm not. I could go to the game, but I'm. I'm going to sit in front of my fireplace, watch the Chiefs, and enjoy it. That's what I'm going to do. Looking forward to it. I'll be doing the same thing. And go Chiefs for sure. You uh, bet. And we'll uh, we'll see you down the road, buddy. Uh, if not in uh, probably not in Tampa Bay, but hopefully next summer for sure in Canton. And if not before then somewhere else. Always enjoy your company, my friend. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Morton.